and welcome to my show. Today I'm going to have an interview with one of the most fascinating actors in movie history. Uh, this man's story uh, can't be told in a single book. It can't be told in a single documentary. This man has touched the lives of so many famous people, it will make your head spin. And I'm talking about the people that are icons in American history. With me today and responsible for this interview is my dear friend Rob Baldacci. Rob, thanks for setting this up. Gary, thank you. This is going to be exciting. We're uh, this is going to, to be uh, one of our best, without question. Uh, the theme has been, quote, the mob in our last three shows. Uh, but this gentleman has, has had his uh, foot in every, uh, every possible place you can think of. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have Gianni Russo. And Gianni, uh, his first role was in The Godfather, Godfather 1. He was in Godfather 2. And since then, he's been in 46 other motion pictures and 60, 60 television shows and motion pictures to his credit, plus books, interviews, everything. Gianni, welcome aboard. Thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Rob, uh, you're, you're in New England. What part of we're in uh, we're in Portland, Portland, in, Maine. Uh, Portland, Maine, and I know when I when I first reached out to you, you were hoping to uh, to come up, but uh, things didn't work out. But we're still pleased to have you uh, and, and interviewing you today uh, via Zoom. And yeah. you're only missing a lobster dinner, Gianni. That's I all know. you're missing. You got <laughs> okay. a free lobster dinner, like you need one. Well, the next the the, the next thing we want to work on with Gianni is to get bring bring him up here with his nightclub act, which is. Yes. Which I, at some point, Gianni, during this interview, I'd, I'd like you to talk a little bit about what you're doing. Oh, I will, please. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But I, 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 th I think uh, a good thing to start off with, Gianni, and, you know, I've, I've seen many interviews. I've read your book. And I think the quote from uh, De Niro says it all. Uh, Gianni Russo walks the walk, talks the talk. <laughs> what a life. A worthy read. For, for anybody that hasn't read this book, and this is a bestseller, uh, I, I couldn't put it down, Gianni. <laughs> it was uh, a page turner from one, one minute to the next. And, uh, and I know you're going to be coming out with a new book here pretty soon, which we want you to talk about uh, when you have a moment or two. No, definitely. Uh, but growing up, you grew up in Little Italy. Uh, tell us a little bit about your family and, uh, and what happened to you as a young kid which I think kind of sets the stage for what happened Well, it later. definitely did. You know, uh, up until six and a half, um, I was just a normal Italian-American kid down in Mul Mulberry Street, thinking everybody over 21 was my uncle, and every <laughs> lady over 21 was my aunt. I thought we had the biggest family in the world, <laughs> but that was the thing that, you know, out of respect, you used to call elderly people aunts and uncles. With that said... Uh, that all changed August 9th, 1949. I got polio, and uh, I was one of the first kids to get it. And they quarantined me in Bellevue Hospital, which is the state hospital on 30th Street and 1st Avenue, which I walked past it yet. The building is still there that I was in, the old one. But they've rebuilt blocks of Bellevue Hospital since then. But uh, it changed my life forever. And I wouldn't change a day of that. I mean, I, believe me, I think going through that, not like our children or grandchildren, with all of the respect to who they are, I had to survive. And I survived watching 2,300 kids pass in five years that I was there. Jesus. And it turned me, it taught me the value of, you know, mobility and just thanking God for being alive. Gianni, you were you were hospitalized for five years. Yes, straight quarantined, oh no visitors, not even your family, your mother and father, no, nobody. Which in a while, yeah, for, for a while there, I, I was getting very bitter because my birthday was approaching December twelfth, which I was there four and a half months, and I asked Dolores Barone, who was Carlo Gambino's niece. Thank God she was there. Yep. And I say that in a way because he told her there's a kid from the neighborhood look after him, not realizing why he would say that until later on in my life. But she used to give me the extra jello and the pudding and give me a hug at the end of the night, which basically kept my sanity. And Gianni, there was a, a, a maintenance guy that worked in the uh, 
Ward, uh, who she warned you about, correct? Her name, his name was Harold. As I got older, when I was young, I was a good looking guy. And as I was getting 10 or 11 years of age there, she warned me about this guy. And, you know, it's not like today where we have so many means of communication giving you these pointers on these kind of people. But I didn't know anything about it. And uh, for some strange reason, after, you know, they tried to encourage you to get out of bed, they wouldn't give you a bedpan anymore once you had some mobility. And fortunately, my right side was so strong, it was my whole left side that was paralyzed. So what I did, I crawled out of bed and slid to the floor and got to the railings all over the walls and dragged myself to the bathroom. And one day there's Porter's broom, these little short brooms that they use in theaters and they call them Porter's brooms. And I just tuck it under my right arm. I don't know why, but thank God I did. And I would go to the bathroom and not in any hurry to get back. And I couldn't stand that a urinal I had to sit on a bowl. I would just sit there and I broke the bristles off the broom and I filed the, the end of the broom handle to a very sharp point with the grout in the floor. Yep. Never knowing why I did it, but thank God I did it because one night Harold Gardner came and um, tried to uh, attack me basically. And I killed him. And you killed him. And, uh, and then what ha just briefly, I know we've got so much ground to cover, Johnny, in, in a short period of time, but what happened after you killed him? Well, they put me up in the psych ward on the seventh floor yeah. for 72 observation, 72 hours, which if you can withstand that, that's a test of uh, endurance. Yeah. Because the floor is like a funnel and it's, it goes from one floor to the next floor. And male or female, everybody's sitting around, everybody's nude, and they would come and wash down the floor maybe every hour on the hour. And they were just observing you and your mannerisms and all of that. And then they let me out. And first of all, I, I was, just, thank God I got out, only to find out later the reason they let me out. They didn't want the rest of the world to know that there was a pedophile amongst all of these kids. And they just wanted to sweep it under the rug. And fortunately, I get out of there. So Gianni, you were never charged Never, no. never brought forth. So they, they knew it was self-defense, obviously. Oh, yeah. And, and you were how old when this happened? Seven. Jesus. This is the most amazing story I've ever I, heard. I know. Go I ahead. Know. And then the stories get better and better as Jeez. we go, we go yeah. on. I know it gets crazy. <laughs> yeah, it does. Well, it's it does. so insane. Where, where do we yeah, go from so here? Nice. Well, we go to Frank Costello. <laughs> okay. And uh, how you met uh, uh, Costello and uh, the members of the, the mafia and and your involvement uh, once you got out, Johnny. And you were just a young kid at the time. Yeah, I was 12, and uh, I went to work in a bakery. I didn't go back home. I was so bitter. And when Dolores wheeled me out, unbeknownst to me, she made them believe she was turning me over to my parents. But when the, when the cab came, she said, take him to 247 Mulberry Street. Okay. And I'm saying, what's 247 Mulberry Street? I knew Mulberry Street. And she, they dropped me off at the Ravenite. Oh, wow. And when I arrived, O'Neill and Gambino was outside with my grandfather and all that. But you think uh, a, a, a veteran was coming home from the war. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were all greeting me, and I'm a kid. I'm yeah. still a gimp. My whole left side of my body is still dwarfed in a, in a way. And I had a, a very minimal use. And after a while there and getting all the accolades and the kisses and this and that, and I'm hearing the apple didn't fall fall, fall off of the tree. I'm saying, what are they talking about, the apple in this? And then I realized that my older uncle, my grandfather's brother, his name was Angelo Russo, and he sent most of these people to this country. And he stayed in Sicily, and in 1949, they hung him when they were trying to clean up La Cosa Nostra in Sicily. Yeah. So that's why I had got these, this respect that, you know, no 12-year-old in the world would get at that age. 
But the fact that I took out this guy, <laughs> that's where they come up with the saying the apple didn't fall far from the tree because right. he was a notorious killer. Wow. Oh that's that's uh, and he was the one <clears throat> who really was responsible for uh, Frank Costello and Lucky Luciano uh, oh, when they yeah. came over here. Correct. Well, he sent Costello's family here. Costello was a little younger okay. than uh, Gambino. But what I found out later on, Carlo Gambino, at the age of 17, came to America as a made man from the Gambino family in Sicily, which still exists. I, I still talk to them over there. Wow. I have a big company over there. I, I'm into Barbera Olive Oil, which I, I rebranded on the Genko. I own that IP <laughs> That's so from cool. the movie. <laughs> So but, yeah, I'm just going to chime into the to the audience. So he just mentions the olive oil. He's also got wine. He's got Italian food. Uh, I'm sure you got pistachio nuts too, or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Go ahead. Well, this, this is my clothing line, La Cosa Mia yeah, by Gianni. <laughs> well, so, we, yeah. we, oh, I love business. I love business. And you've done very well with your life, uh, Gianni, <laughs> coming really f with with nothing and. Uh, and, and it's it's remarkable. So with Costello, you talk a little bit about your relationship with Frank Costello uh, and uh, and meeting some of the members of the uh, the five families and how that, uh, you know, transitioned into meeting, you know, uh, Joe Colombo and uh, the, the whole issue with the Godfather movie, which we should talk well, how, about. How that happened? Well, I was working in a bakery on, on Mott Street. Meg yeah. Nottie's Bakery was a, grandfather, my, a friend of my grandfather's. And again, though I believe in God, and I don't want to sound ridiculous to too many people, but I, I totally believe in this man mm -hmm. who's been watching over me all yeah. this time. I took the job at the bakery, and I was mixing 50-pound bags of flour by hand. I wouldn't use the mixer. Mm -hmm. And I was building up my body. It was like dynamic tension. Anybody who bakes, you know what that is. So I'd, be, I'd make the dough, and then once it rose, we cut it into quarter pound loaves, and then kneaded that with our hands. But the, the coal ovens and the flour in the air, I should have major arthritis right now. I have nothing wrong with me. Ever since I walked out of the hospital, I don't have a thing wrong with me. I got friends getting knees planted. I'll be 80 years old this December, December 12th. No, God bless you. Now you don't look a day over yeah. 78. Yeah. <laughs> great. No, it's you it's look the lighting. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and, uh, explain how you ended up meeting Marilyn Monroe. Uh, oh, my God. Well, uh, how I met Marilyn Monroe is how I met, I had to meet Costello first. I was right. selling ballpoint pens. Right. They just came out. So I took them uptown. I was standing out in front of Sherry Netherlands with my gimp arm and selling these pens that I bought for 10 cents from Leo Rabinowitz on, Mulba on uh, Delancey Street. <laughs> and these ladies would give me a dollar. And this one guy used to come cross town every day around 10.30, between 10.30 and 11, never take a pen. Give me a few dollars, give me $5, and give me words of wisdom. But the one thing I noticed every time he was ready to leave, he'd like give me a hug and made sure he touched my left shoulder, my crippled shoulder. I didn't care what he was doing, keep, keep giving me the money. This went on for months. And then I found out what he was doing by accident. I seen, I used to go see uh, Gambino at Ferraris in the morning. He always went there when he came in from Brooklyn, had coffee and had legitimate meetings at Ferraris Pastry Shop on Grand Avenue. It's still there. Sure. Next Order is a religious store where I still buy all my holy pictures and all that. And they introduced me to this Logorna that people wore around their neck, especially Sicilians. But this one had a hunchback on it. So I said, Joe, what's with the hunchback? He's well, Sicilians are suspicious about touching cripples. Ooh. Well, the blood drained from my face. Yeah. Because I thought Costello liked me. So on the way to the train, I took the end train uptown. There was some little girl selling rabbit's feet for luck, it said, for 10 cents. So I bought a pink one and put it in my pocket. Now, here he comes, just like I knew he would. Every day he's coming. And I'm waiting. So he comes, gives me $5, he gives me words of wisdom. And he goes and touches my shoulder, and I move. 
He goes to touch my shoulder again and he moved. He says, what are you doing? And I said, what you're doing, not what I'm doing. He says, you know who I am? I said, no, I don't know who you are. I don't even want to even know who you are. And he, he couldn't believe my, my attitude at a kid 12 years old. And the guy who I thought was his friend was his bodyguard, Blackie, who I'll get to know for the rest of his life. And uh, he said, you believe this kid? He said, what's your name, kid? I told him my name. He said, who's Angelo Russo to you? I said, Angelo Russo, my great uncle. He said, when's the last time you saw him? I said, well, if you know anything about him, I never saw him. He said, why is that? I said, no, you tell me why. He said, I asked you a question, son, and I want an answer. And they got, now this guy's getting stern. I said, well, they hung him. He said, they hung him? Yeah, I said, they hung him in Sicily. So he tells Blackie, take that cigar box. I said, you ain't taking my cigar box. With this, he took a roll of money out I've never seen in my life. And he gives me three $100 bills. He's on buying your pens. I had maybe $7 worth of pens, <laughs> gave me $300. <clears throat> And he said, you know where the Waldorf is? I said, yeah, I know where every public bathroom is in New York, because that's where I was going. I lived in these places. He said, meet me there tomorrow under the clock in the lobby at, at 10. I was there at 9, make sure I didn't miss the guy. Yeah. And I worked with him until 1973 when he died. Jesus, wow. And he told me he the story that, you know, my great uncle was responsible for so many people. And, um, and then he told me about Gambino. I said, I know Mr. Gambino. He said, you know Carlo Gambino? I said, yeah, he gave me a transistor radio for my birthday. He says, I don't know who you are, but this is getting crazier. <laughs> so, but anyway. Yeah. And then we all met down there one day. Uh -huh. We all met at the Ravenite. And uh, again, it got bigger because now I'm dealing with, you know, Tony Anastasia, who was the head of the International Longshoreman Union. He became my my... He baptized me at my confirmation when I was 12. And this circle got keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger throughout the world. Unbelievable. Uh, so Gianni, uh, so far we've been on here about 20 minutes and we, we're only at age 11. <laughs> so, I know. We you only jump around. We well, got about 70, well, I listen, you know, I 70 years to go here. Yeah. That's one thing about me. Uh, I don't know how much time you have. No, well, so we, we, so we, we, the we, interview's an hour, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We, we got you for an hour, buddy. Uh, but Rob was asking you, about, well, first of all, you, you did the, the Godfather. You, you, you met Marilyn Monroe shortly, uh, a few years later. You met her before you were in the Godfather, right? You were 16. Yeah, I met her because I was running, I, I was a personal errand boy for Costello for the first three or four years. And he always had guests staying at the Waldorf. So there's one day he said, I'm going fishing with Ocado, the head of Chicago outfit. He used to go fishing with him a lot. They, they used to love to fish. Anyway, he said, I got a guest tomorrow being Saturday, go up there, check on her around 12. There's no problem. Now, what I didn't tell you, I got caught by a troon officer because I was only 15 on the streets of New York, and they sent me to continuation school till I was 16. And Costello arranged for me to go to, to, Lily, um, to uh, Wilford Academy on top of Lindy's, which was one of my routes. This is the only way it makes sense. So yeah, I was there, right. and then Mark Sinclair and Kenneth, who was Senator John F. Kennedy's personal hairdresser, needed shampoo boys, and they hired me. And the fourth head of hair I shampooed was Marilyn Monroe. And I used to go to the New York Theater, the Paramount Theater, 24 hours a day, when Costello went home, I had nowhere to go. I go watch movies there. I saw some like it had ten times. <laughs> now you're washing her hair. Now I'm washing her hair. <laughs> now, now we know the configuration of a shampoo a basin. So uh, let me clean this up a little bit. That's I have okay. my three piece set on her shoulder. Yeah. And as, a, as yeah, I'm you massaging, need to clean this up. she's moving. <laughs> go ahead. And I'm fantasizing <laughs> yeah. seeing this lady singing, "I want to make love to you" in the movie. And I'm getting aroused, and I'm saying, how am I going to get her from this shampoo basin to this, these two fun oaks chair in the middle of the, in the, middle of the salon? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we'll, we'll move on from there. We'll, we'll move on from there, but you, you end up seeing her several times thereafter, right? 
Please. for four years straight. Yes. I was the last person to see her at Cal Neva. The, the last weekend of her life, she was up in Cal Neva again, now that JFK was president and Costello was commissioned by Joe Kennedy to get the mob and all the unions involved again to become president. And that happened. The mob was supposed to get all their casinos back in Cuba. But as we all know in American history, Bobby didn't believe that there were Russian missiles. So the Bay of Pigs, the airstrike was called off and the mob got nothing. So now it's two years. He got the presidency. The mob got nothing. We're up in Cal Neva for a different reason. They want to use Marilyn as a, a, a pawn for Bobby because Bobby took over where John stopped seeing Marilyn for a year because he told Marilyn, I got to watch because I'm a Catholic, you know, I'm, and I'm married to Jackie. But see my brother for a year. I mean, she was so naive. And unbeknownst to us, which is in my new book, she got an abortion about six weeks before this beating, aborting one of John's kids because he couldn't have any more kids. He was married to Ethel, and he's the attorney general. You mean, you you mean, mean Bobby's right. kids? Bobby, Bobby, right. Bobby, yes. right, yes. So with that said, they were trying to get Bobby in bed with her one time like they did Jay Hoover in Chicago because he was a cross-dresser, and he always denounced that there was even a mob because of that. Right. But she went ballistic and said, I'm going to the press. I want nothing to do with these Kennedys. I fly back to New York. I tell Frank what's going on. Is they're going to kill her? And sure enough, they killed her. And like, you know, we're, we're all intelligent people now. I'm surprised that St. Martin's Press and my Macmillan, who's the parent company that published my book, which the cover was just shown to, to you, your audience, yep. they vetted this. I put this in my book. I said that Robert Kennedy killed Marilyn Monroe. Do you know the these, these series now, this past June, where he denied he was even in California, they have Bobby Kennedy in her apartment for four hours that night from testimony from the CIA, the ambulance driver, and all. That's why this next book is being stronger than the one I just wrote. Wow. But no, this is getting crazier. Uh, G Gianni, um, I I've got to tell you, I've heard you say that before. And we had John Alite, uh, uh, Alite on our show. I uh -huh. asked him the question point blank, was Kennedy killed by the mob? I asked him point blank certain questions. Uh, and I just watched a, a, a documentary on Mel Monroe where the guy says he seemed to confirm that there was, that it was a suicide that was his position and that they, the other people knew about it. But your contention is that it was set up. So who would have who would have done the act? Who would have uh, who would have done the act uh, to to her? The, the, I won't give you his name. He's an anesthesiologist. He was used by the Vatican to get rid of a pope. That was in for thirty days. And how he killed Marilyn? He, in, we all have a, a fallopian organ in our groin area. He got a syringe and threw her pubic hair so he wouldn't see the the bunch of marks, just pumped oxygen in her. She died of an ambulism. They staged that whole thing. She was in an ambulance. If you saw, you you said you just saw that documentary. Yes. They had her in an ambulance going to a hospital. She died in that, in that ambulance. They brought the body back and staged this. Yes. And there's another book out right now called Collateral Dam Damage yep. by Mark Shaw. And he attest to it. And I'm going to try, and to be, if it's my last act on life, I'm going to get her death certificate reversed because she did not commit suicide. Uh, G she, she didn't. G yeah. Gianni, what you've just said to us, and I'm, I'm just amazed by the statement you just made. You had a relationship with this woman that began when you were a young boy. and right, 15 it, and, and, it, a half. and it matured to a point where you are willing to stake your reputation uh, to get her death certificate changed because you want the world to know that this woman did not commit suicide. 
had no reason to commit suicide. She wasn't nope. so. She was, she was the happiest time of her life. She was studying with Strasbourg. She just got a major legitimate part. She didn't want to be a sex symbol. That's why she left Zanuck. And she was about to go back to Joe DiMaggio. Mm -hmm. So her life turned around. She stayed in New York for a year. I saw her almost every day when she had time to. And I used to, I was a companion. We were friends, we weren't lovers, but we both had the same thing in common. At 12, she was in an in a orphanage and she used to look at the water tower of Warner Brothers and said that someday I'll be, I'm gonna be a movie star. Uh, Gianni, my seventh okay. floor, I'm, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I, I, I just, I didn't want to interrupt you except to say that I brought this magazine with me and I was gonna to say to you in a joking way that I think your greatest accomplishment in life was getting to know this woman because uh, I'm one of those people that absolutely adore oh, yeah. Marilyn Monroe and all of her talent and all of that she went through. And I just wanna to say to you, congratulations, because you have fulfilled the dream of every single uh, man on the face of this earth. And I gotta tell you, I bought Joe DiMaggio's autograph for one reason only. I told people, I said, the hand that signed this autograph <laughs> Touched Mel Monroe. So Gianni, oh, you, I, you, I, I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. No, but you have to come down here. I will. And see the shrine I have for her, the pictures oh. of her and I together. Yes. So, Gianni, and every, I, every night yeah. when we were together, because I stayed at the Waldorf a lot, she would kiss a pillowcase and sign it. Oh, wow. You know how much those pillowcases are worth today? Oh, my God. <laughs> Priceless. Johnny, uh, you and I had talked about this a uh, few weeks ago about Marilyn, and you, was, you, were, you commented, how, you, uh, clearly you really cared for her. You loved her, I think. Oh, my God, yeah. No, she was like, it was such a strange situation. Basically, and, you know, it's funny because I've done so many motion pictures with co-stars of her. Yeah. Like Tony Curtis, Frank Sinatra, Marlon and Brenda. They all had their way with her. Right. Well, her, she had such a low esteem I know it. that that's all she thought she can give you is their body. So when she saw you looking at her, she would offer it to you. Wow. Kind of sad. Yeah. When she invited me into her bathtub for the first time. She was just being nice. Yeah. You know, it was, I mean, it, it's when you, you, when you start reading these books and I have the privilege because when I left Cal Neva that day, and that's all documented. She was there, and so was Robert Kennedy. I mean, now things are starting to come out. But when I left and I told Costello that, you know, he, he said they're going to kill her, I called her neighbor because Marilyn and I had a dog together. She loved animals. But I knew she was all over the place, and I used to pay the lady because I was making good money then already. I mean, forget about it. Costello made me a very rich man early on in my life. Mm -hmm. For my 18th birthday, he gave me three hat check rooms. I was making 400 and something dollars a night from each one, all wow. cash. Yeah. So I mean, so I used to take care of this lady and I said, get everything that's personal out of that, her, her apartment. Yeah, wow. Because she's gonna die. I met her about a month later, gave her money. She said, can I keep the dog? I said, of course. She gave me a shopping bag. In that shopping bag are three marbleized, you know the notebooks kids go to school with? Mm -hmm. Those marbleized black and white, you know, yeah, they're maybe yes. like 11 by 12. Right. Yes. About 400 pages each. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have three of those handwritten by Marilyn Monroe, her diary. Wow. G Gianni, you're in possession of not only those pieces of memorabilia, you're telling me that you've got basically her diary, handwritten diary. You, you, you know, there's a diary of Anne Frank, and now we're talking about the diary of <laughs> Mel Monroe, and you've got that, you've got possession of that. I own it, but they're mine, she gave it to me. And, and so Gianni, I, I wanna ask you a question, but I could talk about her all day, and we gotta move on because you, so this, many things you've done. Yeah. But what was she, she was a very smart person, wasn't she? Oh my God, brilliant. Yeah. It's self-learned, I mean, she read everything there was. I mean, this girl was very intelligent. That, and that's what the Xanax were trying to make her look like some dumb blonde. Yeah, right. I know it. I know it. And that's, know why it. She, that's why she left them. And nobody knows when she gained the weight, because there was a weight in her contract, 
That's when she was pregnant. She's got a 63-year-old living daughter right now. I'm in contact with her. Wow. That's, that's news. <laughs> and uh, we Jim, don't know whether it's Joe DiMaggio's or my kid. And I really don't want to know. Okay. I, 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 excuse me. You mean that there's a 50% chance in your mind that this person is, is, is your daughter? I, I could be. I mean, as, <laughs> we, we were the only two people at that time having uh, relationships with her. Yeah, you and wow. Joe DiMaggio. Yep. Uh, Johnny, uh, in the interest of time, yeah. I'd like to move on to The Godfather. Go ahead, go ahead. My because God. I think, you know, uh, probably the number one movie of all time. Yes. No question. No question. In most uh, there's a TV series called The Offer. Uh, I'd like you to comment on that. But specifically, if you could talk about how you ended up getting a part on The Godfather, because I think, and, and, and some of the interactions you had with Marlon Brando, James Caan, Pacino, uh, it's absolutely fascinating. It would be a book by itself. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> another, book. No, but, uh, another book. No, but another book. I read my ego. Now you understand. I'm 26 years of age. I really have a million dollars. Yep. My boat was three million when I was 21. I have a 148 foot Riva. But with this said, I always wanted to be. Not. People say you're a good guy. You should become an actor. But I didn't want to go through the trials and tribulations. But they wrote in the L.A. Times, the book was already in its third print, that they were going to use unknowns. I said, this is my shot. So I had somebody read me the book because I can't read. I'm an illiterate. And, they, and as they're reading, I said, I could play Michael, Sonny, or Carlo. So I shot a screen test. I had the money. I put it together. And Betty McCart, who was Al Ruddy's secretary at that time and assistant, I was dating her girlfriend in Beverly Hills. Pokey Noonan. So she made the arrangement for me to have a drive on to Paramount Lot to deliver my real myself to him. I said, what does he like? She said, he likes Oriental girls and great cars. I just bought a 65 Bentley Silver Cloud, tricked out. I got a Chinese chick to drive me on the lot <laughs> in the car to get his attention. All of this is in the offer, but totally different. <laughs> yeah. Let's move on. <laughs> he sends me a letter saying, I'm sorry we misled you. We're really not going to use unknowns. So now I read that Joe Colombo in New York is picking in the FBI building and boycotting the film. So I know Joe, and I know how these guys think, these mob guys. It's always about money. So I fly up. I go see him on 86th Street, and we hug and kiss and all that. Because, you know, I met him through all these guys, all through the Kennedy elections. All I met every mob guy there was throughout the United States. Yeah. I said, Joe, I said, I got an idea. We could make a lot of money with Scott Bob. You notice I said, we. He's okay. How are we going to do this? And he just hired a guy called Barry Schlotnick, a young attorney, to represent the Anti-Defamation League, Italian Anti-Defamation League. I said, why don't I arrange a meeting at Paramount, which is at the Gulf and Western building now, which is Trump Plaza on Columbus Circuit. He said, you could do that? I said, I need your permission. I just got this idea. So he looks at Barry. So what do you think, Barry? He said, let him go talk to him. Let's see what happens. So I go up there, and there they all come. Stanley Jaffe, Bobby Evans, Al Ruddy, even Greg Fredrickson, one of the producers. And I get up, go up to, I'm in the lobby. I said, guys, you got a problem in New York. Oh, we got no problem. I said, excuse me, okay? I just left Joe Colombo. They looked at each other. They said, what'd you do? I said, I just left Joe Colombo. He wants to meet you. You just met Joe Colombo. He wants to meet us. I said, yeah. He said, will he come here? I said, come anywhere you want. Could you bring him here tomorrow morning? I said, what time do you want him? They said, 10 o'clock. I said, he'll be here. I go back down the street because they're on Madison Avenue where the headquarters were. I said, the meeting's on. I said, can I make a suggestion? They said, yeah. I said, well, who's going to the meeting? Be Barry, you, and myself. Let's take some heavyweights, because I knew the guys in this crew, Butteress, De Chico, he, and, and what, Lenny Montana. He was a collector for them. Lenny was an ex-wrestler. That's how Lenny got the part of Luco Brazzi in the movie. Oh, oh wow. So now we go up there. <laughs> well, we're sitting there. around, and they're ready to do it all, you know. And they're getting up, they're shaking hands. Barry Schlank's going to read the book, what he, Joe wants out. If they take it out, 
he'll get the cooperation in the neighborhood, he'll get the cooperation of the unions, and they're shaking hands. I said, Joe, whoa, whoa, what about me? So he looks around, they're all standing ready to leave. I said, Joe, tell him to sit down. He didn't even say nothing. He raised his hand like he was God and moved his hand down. They all sat down. I said, let me tell you something. I arranged this. I want a part in the movie. So Ruddy <laughs> said, well, I'm going to give you a part. I said, let me say this to you, okay? Who's playing Michael? They all looked at each other. And what I'm about to tell you, most people don't know. They said, Jimmy Conner. He was playing Michael. I said, who's playing Sonny? They said, Carmine Caridi. He's in a play in the man from La Mancha because they wanted this big guy. They thought Sonny should be a big guy. I said, who's playing Carlo? They said, we didn't get to that part yet. I said, Joe, I want to play Carlo. So he looks at them. He says, he's playing Carlo. Now, that's in another book. Wow. So James so, Patterson's book, okay. and he's no slouch writer. We all know right, James right, Patterson. Right. Your audience, you go to page 70 and 71, and it's right on those two pages that Joe Colombo says Johnny Russo plays Carlo, and if I like everything else, you can make the movie. Amazing. And, <laughs> uh, and in, yeah. No, but this is crazy. No, now they're saying crazy. on a 10-hour episode, Ruddy gave me the part. Ruddy had nothing to do with it. Forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but Gianni, what blows my mind is that your character, along with every every bit part in that movie, from you know to Luca Bracci, and right, your character is one of the most iconic characters in movie history. Because uh, you you see, you're at the wedding, you're a handsome guy, everybody thinks you're going to be wonderful, and then you you're beating the heck out of Talia Shire. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I, I've got to take this this time to show the scene uh, that's one of the most memorable scenes in movie history. It's where Jimmy Kahn uh, takes you on. And uh, we're going to insert that right here, Dino, if you don't mind. Okay, I'm just, uh, just going to give the doctor to come and take a look at you. Ronnie, please don't do anything. Please don't do it. Okay. <laughs> What's the matter with you? What am I going to do? I'm going to make that baby an orphan before he's born. <laughs> huh? Hmm? <laughs> All right? He's spat slop. Still betting Yankees pretty heavy. Brand new ball game again. Don't have to stop taking action out, right? Last of the night. We lost enough money last week on the game. Oh, come here, come here, come here, come here. Oh. Um, so after watching that, I need to ask you, and Rob and I want to ask you, did did Khan hurt you? <laughs> it looked like he hurt you. Yeah, well, that's not a great only question. did Khan hurt me, and I've been saying he hurt me for 50 years. <laughs> With that garbage pail cover that was steel, not plastic like we have today, be he chipped my elbow. Yeah. Then when I crawl out from under the gate, he kicks me, and we choreographed. As soon as he touched me, I would roll over. Well, that day he drop kicks me and breaks two ribs. Oh, my God. Now, in the offer, there's a scene. They're re re redoing it with an actor. And the AD and Francis Ford Coppola said, we got to stop this. He's getting hurt. Al Ruddy, on camera, or the character playing Al Ruddy, who's the producer, says, let it go a while. Let's, let's teach this punk a lesson. And, and These people are crazy saying this on film. I'm alive. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. 
And, but Gianni, after that, after you had that injury, had you shot other scenes? For example, another one of the most iconic, I, I keep using that word because it is, it's, it's memorable, is when you're, you're sitting there and, and, and Michael says he's going to send you off to Vegas to run the hotel, whatever. Right. So you, did you, but you knew that as you sat there, you're going to be killed within minutes, right? I mean, as, as oh, the, yeah. So I just want to commend you because now that I know you, uh, I I remember watching that scene saying you did such a great job acting like you really think you're going to go to Vegas. That's yeah, what was, it was so great. Brando, I have to say something. That's why I'm the only person in the world to say what I'm about to say. Marlon Brando was my only acting teacher, and Frank Sinatra was my only singing teacher. Right. Oh my God! And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I I have actually talked to this man six years ago. My niece sent me a CD of his Frank Sinatra thing, and by luck, I saw a phone number on there and called it, and this gentleman an answered the phone and talked to me for 15 minutes with such respect, the same respect we're getting today. Yeah, she, and I just can't believe that, the, uh, that now we're, 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 we're friends, Gianni, but go ahead, Rob. Uh, Gianni, uh, James Kahn, to explain what happened uh, with you and Kahn, uh, which I think is also an interesting story and a little side note to The Godfather, and also the relationship that you did have with Marlon Brando. Well, Marlon, you know, when we had the rehearsal of Patsy's on 119th Street, I used to be yeah. up there all the time with Pat right. Tony Salerno, that was his club. I used to bring Midnight Loan, so I knew everybody up there. So when I got there, Danny Pagano Sr., Jr., Tony Federici, all the mob guys were there. And they said to me, what are you doing here at 3 o'clock? I said, I'm here for the rehearsal. They said, for The Godfather? I said, yeah. I said, I got a big part in this. Get out of here, you're not even an actor. I saw I'm in it. So I go into the rehearsal. I'm, I'm running, I'm nowhere getting close to time. So we get into the rehearsal, everybody's there. Coppola says, nobody have eye contact, nobody approach Brando, nobody look at him. And that was it, I didn't care. So we waited, we rehearsed for about 45 minutes, they took a break, and Brando walks over to me. So I figured, I ain't doing nothing wrong. <laughs> he says, you're a big TV actor. I said, no. He said, you got a big movie coming up. I said, no. He said, you're not on Broadway. I know everybody on Broadway. He said, you're right again. He said, who'd you study with? I said, what are you talking about? Study what? And this, he calls Copo over. He says, Francis. And I never broke down the script. But by ego, I just wanted to be in the movie. What do I care? He says, this guy marries my daughter, undermines my family, gets my oldest son, Sonny, killed, brings Michael in, this guy's got to be a great actor. And I'm saying to myself, this guy's trying to get me fired. Everybody already thinks I'm not in the movie to begin with. I wouldn't be able to go back to the neighborhood. So I don't know, I don't know protocol. I said, Francis, go over there a minute. And Francis left. I dismissed the director. Well, the whole room, you could hear a pin drop now saying, who is this guy? I'm already dressed in Brioni suits. I got a mentally outside. They don't know me from Adam, but I got this part. So not only did I look at Brando, I put my arm around him. And I walk him to the back because I don't want to embarrass him. <laughs> I get nose to nose with Brando. I said, let me tell you something, Mr. Brando. At all due respect, I know who you are. Listen to me carefully. If you get me fired, I will suck on your heart and you will bleed out right here. You understand me? <laughs> and he looked at me. He stepped back. He said, that was brilliant. He thought I was acting. I meant it. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best story. I know it. But he continued to counsel you and mentor you and, and work with you. From that day on, he asked for a ride home with me. Because I thought he liked the car or me. He liked the chick. He, he liked, liked the oriental you. girl. I gave her to him two years later. She went to Tahiti and lived with him. That's crazy. Now, then you, then you worked in The Freshman also. You did The Freshman. That was my biggest film. Yeah. I got him $15 million. It was the biggest paycheck I ever got. Yes. He got $15 million to play Carlo Gambino. I mean, uh, yeah. you know, uh, Don Corleone again. I, I, I've got to tell you, that movie was a 10 on a 10 score. Oh, yeah, it was and great. It just blows my mind that you're... That you accomplished this friendship with Marlon Brando with a threat. Till the day he died. Till the day he died. In fact, he called me at 2 o'clock in the morning. I just had an altercation in my club in Vegas, October 28, 1989. I heard about that. Go I, ahead. I, oh, yeah. I killed Pablo Escobar, one of his main guys, Lorenzo Morales, after he attacked a customer. It was all self defense. And I was, I was, you know, six days in inquest. I was like free. So he calls me up at two o'clock in the morning. 
His son, Brandon, just shot his brother-in-law in the house and killed him. After Brando gave him his gun, because he used to beat up Cheyenne, the sister, all the time as she was pregnant. So the son came in and said, Daddy, he's doing it again. He's take my gun and go kill him. That's why Brando got involved in that. Yes. And the kid went in and killed him. So he calls me up. He says, Johnny, I said, what's the matter? He says, I got a big problem. I said, what is it? He says, my son just shot my, my son-in-law. I said, you call the cops yet? He said, no. I said, don't call nobody. I go, have somebody call your house. Don't call nobody. Who's there? He's my daughter, and I, I'm perfect. I said, get her out of the house. I call Robert Shapiro. Because yeah. Steve Wynn got Robert Shapiro to defend me if I was going to be charged. But I knew I was going to be charged with self-defense, the guy I killed. So I call Bobby up. I got his home number, all his numbers, you know. And I wake him up. He's, why are you calling here so late? I said, calm down. He's such a pompous asshole to begin with. He is, yeah. I said, I got a guy that needs your help right now. He said, tell him to call my office. I said, it's Marlon Brando. He's what? I said, Marlon Brando needs you to call him right now. He said, give me his number. <laughs> this is unbelievable. Five hours later, I see Robert Shapiro, Marlon Brando, outside of the L.A. Correctional Center where they're booking the sun. They're on the street outside. <laughs> That's he a, got him five years. He did three. And then the kid killed himself anyway. Terrible, yes, that, terrible, that's correct. real yeah. tragedy. Frank Sinatra, yeah. uh, the relationship you had, you, you know, he, he taught you how to sing. Uh, he you, how to you, sing. He baptized my son, Luciano. That's right. He's your, the, your son's godfather. Uh, talk about your relationship, specifically with respect to the godfather, because always uh, we've heard stories where Sinatra did not want that scene with Al, Al Martino, uh, who really portrayed Sinatra. Uh, well, trying he to wanted get... no reference of him because they, everybody knew it was supposed to be Sinatra. But Gianni, right? didn't he give well, you a hard time? Know. Didn't he give you a hard time for being in the movie? And didn't that affect well, your no, relationship? He, he caught me off guard. He called me. Dorothy called me. He said, the old man wants to talk to you. I got on the phone. He's with friends, right? I said, of course. I said, if I asked you to do me a favor, would you do it? I said, whatever you want, Frank. He said, I don't want you to do the movie. It's one movie. It's The Godfather. I said, okay, you don't want me to do it, I won't do it. And he hung up on me. Now I'm saying to myself, am I nuts? I'm going to give this up. So I waited a day. I called him back. I said, Darwin, give me the old man. I used his dialogue. I said, Frank, you're my friend, right? He said, yeah. I said, if I asked you to do me a favor, would you do it? Say anything you want. <laughs> Is if I asked you not to do here to eternity, would you have done it? And he hung up on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! And then, you, but you still continued to have a relationship oh, with Frank. Uh, and... No, he's bipolar. I, I, I've helped him. I flew with him everywhere. I, I, I went to see Ava Gardner with him one night. I mean, it was crazy. And then when Ava moved to London, he said, "Come with me," because we were on our way to Red Cross Ball. Grace Kelly, because her, him and I stood very close to Grace until she died. But wow. we were at the Red Cross Bowl all the time. And then we know uh, he wanted to teach me how to sing. He thought I could be a good singer, and I did. And he made me make a promise, and I kept that promise. I sing that one song that he dedicated to Ava Gardner then, I dedicate in my show, and hopefully you guys will see it. I hope so, yeah. To uh, her. Uh, and the, the people, I get a standing ovation from it. He yeah, really I, told me how to sing it. Uh, Gianni, I just want to chime in and let you know that one of my dear friends who just passed away is Bobby Rydell. Oh, wow. Uh, sure. Yes, we, I've been with him quite a few times, and I was at, at his funeral where I also met uh, Frank Sinatra's bodyguard uh, in his later years. Uh, but I just want to say that... Bodyguard? What about Let me hear who's his bodyguard now. What's uh, his name? I, 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 uh, his first name is Merrill. Uh, and he's a former Atlantic City police officer, and he was at the... Oh, yeah, he was. I know that yeah. guy well. Yeah. Yes, I bet you did. But in any event... Well, Sinatra was at the Sands, and he booked me at, at the Claridge next door. His but, last performance. Well, the reason why I wanted to bring in Bobby Rydell is because he sings Sinatra, and he did Summer Wind, and I taped him doing it. And I've heard your version of Sinatra's songs, and I just want to say that there are only certain people that can sing Sinatra and do a half-decent job. Rydell is one of them, of course. And you are, in my opinion, having heard your album, The Other. So I just want to oh, well, congratulate you. That's a big that. compliment. Yeah, thank it you. is. Well, it is gonna, it's meant with, uh, with, with sincerity. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, Gianni, uh, the JFK assassination, uh, Jimmy Hoffa. I mean, we could go on and on because you've, you've been 
a pivotal uh, element of, of all of the all of these uh, stories that we we've, we've grown up with. I mean, we we we've, we've we've heard more more names that are front page uh, magazine covers. Yeah. Uh, bring, uh, bring me back again whenever you want. Well, I like you guys. Uh, Gianni, I think we've got to do that. We've I'm, got about I'm, ten or fifteen more minutes. We do. I believe yeah. we do. Okay. G uh, Gianni, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the question is, did the mob kill JFK? And I think... Of course not. No. Of, no did, way. Did the mob kill JFK? Oh, the mob. Oh, shit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. The mob... The mob killed JFK. And I'll tell you who had the kill shot. He was in the sewer coming up the knoll. It was Johnny Roselli. Johnny Roselli was being trained by the CIA to kill Fidel Castro. He, him and Santo Traficante were doing that for a year. And it's two years later, and nothing was happening with Fidel Castro. And they wanted the casinos back. Yep. And they warned Joe. Joe got a stroke that they were going to start taking out his kids. And nobody trusted each other. There was three shooters that day. Lee Harvey Oswald was hired by Marcellos in New Orleans. He heard him on a radio station sent from out of Texas. And he made this guy like the biggest hero in the world. He said, you kill him. I'm, I, I'm you, you know, this, that. Then, then they had Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby was running all the slots for Costello in Texas. Mm -hmm. They said, we'll put you in the cell. You kill him. They had a whole train re chain reaction. But Roselli... When you see the JFK tapes, which we've all seen on the times, there was no way that Lee Harvey Oswald shot him because the back of JFK's head was blown out from the front on the angle that was from the storm sewer. That was Johnny Rosselli in that. That's why Johnny Rosselli was killed. Yeah. Johnny Rosselli was found in a 50 gallon drum. They were bringing him in. That's right. That's right. Uh, and you actually were carrying money from uh, Frank Costello to Carlos, uh, Carlos uh, Mus 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 Muscello, Muscello yeah. in they, New they, Orleans. Everybody chipped in. And you, and you actually might have bumped into Lee Harvey Oswald. Is that correct? Not might have. I did. I was waiting to go to the bathroom. He said, somebody's in there. I don't know if you have no moose guys. It's, it's a little, it's a little restaurant that he owns. Uh -huh. But uh, and there was one bathroom. I've been there a hundred times, and uh, I waited. And this guy bunks into me. I paid no attention to him. Then I went to see him, and I was about to sit down. That's some pasta bungalow. He said, "No, no, you got to get back to New York." And he whispers in my ear the message, just as Corky Savella did, Tony Accardo did, all the major guys who were in on this. They got the okay, and I carried the message to him. And then he gave me a manila envelope. This was on a Tuesday. I left that Friday. I was going under the Verrazano Bridge. And they said that they shot the president. Mm -hmm. I thought they were going to kill Bobby, to be honest with you. I liked JFK. I hung out with him for months while they were campaigning. Yeah. I, saw, I saw him every weekend at the, at the Sands, the Copa Room in Vegas. Yeah. But uh, no, I mean, it was, uh, I mean, I, I, I had to go to my room. I was sick because I really liked the guy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I you know how do you recover from something like that, having been involved in possibly uh, the assassination? I mean, it's just. Well, they had a lot of uh, arrest warrants for me. I left the country for twenty. That's right. Months. They they sent you over to Europe. That's I, yeah. I understand. I was there twenty two months. Yeah. Wow, wow. You no, know, some of the stuff that I'm getting into, even in my other books now, with Saddam Hussein and uh, I, I don't know if you know Adnan Khashoggi and oh, sure. Bob Shaheen and them. Yeah, I, I mean, you could you could go on and on. We only have a few minutes left, correct, uh, Derry? Uh, right, um, uh, Gianni. Um, I, I just want to close by uh, asking. I, I read that you're appearing somewhere in September. There's an event that's surrounding you coming up this September. Am I correct? Oh yeah, I'm, they're yes. honoring me down in uh, San Diego. Yes. And then uh, that's on the 29th. If anybody's down there, come. And then when I did, Paula Casino invited me back. I'm doing my show there, which is on the borderline of Riverside in California. That's on that Saturday. And then friends of mine in Beverly Hills, I'm with Herb Alpert at the uh, Vibrato on that Sunday doing the show. So I figured I'd bound to keep singing while I'm out there. So, <laughs> so right. you're going to be... I'm, I'm, I'm actually down in resorts on uh, October 8th. 
for Columbus Day weekend. Right. Resort to Atlantic City. And you, you go to New York City and, and, and perform there, too, also? I perform everywhere, yep. Yeah. Yep. All yeah. over the place. Uh, and how, about how many shows uh, a, a year uh, do you think you do, Gianni, where you're singing? I do about, I would say, 25. I'll probably do more this year because th this show is based on my book. I turned my book into a musical, and the clips that I have, I mean, you can't believe. I found a picture of me being the poster boy for the March of Dimes for Eddie Cantor and President Roosevelt. Wow. Uh, G Gianni, can you just briefly, I know we only got a couple of minutes left, just talk a little bit about your projects that you're involved in, what you got looking forward to now. You got a new book coming out, a new TV yeah, show. The Sixth, the Sixth Family. Okay. I have Hollywood Godfather podcast. Yep. It's in 73 countries. My clothing line, La Cosa Mia by Gianni. My food line, Corleone Fine Italian, you can find it online. Yep. It's sold in 73 countries. My vodka is about to expand to seven more spirits under Don Corleone. And on and on, my coffee line is coming out. My pastries are coming out. I got, I got uh, Clemenza's. Great. <laughs> take the gun, keep the cologne. Cannoli. Keep the cannoli. Take the gun, <laughs> take the cannoli. Take the, leave the gun. gun, take the cannolis coming out. It's, I just try to capitalize Good on for you. Absolutely, absolutely. And we hope to have you in Maine uh, with your act. Please. We will. Let's do it. We I will, Gianni. Yeah, we will. Uh, if Rob uh, Baldacci... Uh, I'll uh, make it happen. Uh, ...says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Uh, Gianni, I'm just going to close by saying this: is, we're not done. First of all, uh, Rob and his quest... And secondly, we've got to have you back because I'm going to read the book and I'm going to have a million more questions. Uh, you are such, uh, such a distinguished gentleman. When they talk about that Dos Equis commercial, who's the world's most interesting man? Well, no wonder the guy looks like you. Uh, <laughs> uh, seriously. Uh, That's thank good, you, Gary. Thank uh, you so, so much. I, I really I want, appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you, uh, you coming on the show. Uh, my newspaper ad will say the most fascinating interview that Rob and I have ever done. Uh, thanks, I appreciate Gianni. that. Make um, sure you send that to me, too. Oh, I'll, we will. You'll, you'll, you'll get the link. Yeah. Absolutely. Can, I'm sure you'll watch it ad nauseum. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Gianni Russo. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you uh, on the next Jerry Lundman show.